The Alberta government's relationship with its chief medical officer, Dr. Dina Hinshaw, has been fraught with tension for a while now, and that kind of uh, came to a head today with publication of the C a CBC story uh, based on uh, secret audio recordings of uh, meetings between her and the politicians over the last X number of months. And this morning we talked to a, an Alberta law professor about what that means from a legal point of view. And now we're gonna talk to Stuart Prest, who's a political scientist, about what that means from a political point of view. So welcome to the interview, Stuart. Oh, thanks for having me back on. So I think there are two ways to address this. One is the, the, the proper and appropriate relationship between the politicians and the, and the way that they make decisions. And the second is uh, so our, their relationship with, with Henshaw. And then secondly, the, whether or not the, this particular government is being overly influenced by the political views of its base, which tend to be more conservative and cynical spreaders are, you know, that sort of thing. So let's address the first one. What's your take on the relationship between the politicians and Hinshaw? Well, so there, there are different ways to understand whether the government is operating uh, appropriately. So in a sense, we hold governments ultimately responsible for the decisions that are taken. We elect them to consider a wide variety of information. And that includes uh, the uh, advice of experts like uh, Dr. Hinshaw. It also considers uh, political factors as well. That's appropriate for governments be, to be ultimately taking decisions. And in, in a case like a pandemic, an emergency, the legislation will often empower uh, particular uh, nonpartisan actors like Dr. Hinshaw to, to make decisions uh, without co consulting uh, the, the government of the day to have expanded powers to act. But no matter what the legislation says, ultimately she is in that position only so long as she has the confidence of, of the uh, the, uh, the the cabinet and her minister and, and the premier. And so, um, so she is uh, always has to be aware of that that her position is contingent on on maintaining that that relationship. And the transcripts really make clear that that is a a core <laughs> something she wakes up thinking about and goes to sleep thinking about. And it's a and that's for good reason. Uh, if she were to to really push to the limit her, her authority and really challenge the government and, and, and do so in what would inevitably become a very public way, she may not be long for the job. And that means somebody else may be doing that job instead. And so this is a, it's, it's a, an unenviable position for her to be in. So, so it is a, appropriate for her to consider those things given her position, uh, but it, it may lead to her to be a little more timid in the advice that she's, she's making. And, and clearly Albertans are, are paying a price for that, but ultimately we, the responsibility for that is on cabinet is on the government of the day. And our system ensures that ultimately they're the ones who have to pay a price for it. And it's a political price. Is, it fair, to, is it fair to say then, Stuart, that the relationship between Dr. Hinshaw and, and Premier Kenny and Health Minister Tyler Shandro and other act, political actors in this process, it's a balancing act. And, and, and it has to be, you know, there, there has to be political considerations or have to be medical evidence and, and advice from Dr. Hinshaw and all of that gets balanced out in a reasonable, appropriate way. But it looks from what we can tell that maybe it's, in, it's not been appropriately balanced, that it's maybe been tilted too far to the political side of things. Would that be a, a reasonable take on this? I think so. I think um, particularly given the abundance of evidence that we have in, in this global pandemic, there's, there's not a lot here that's mysterious. We know what an effective response looks like and we know what an insufficient response looks like. And we, we also know, and we know this both from medical practitioners and economists who have looked at it, that as much as uh, politicians may want to talk about the economic case being in tension with the medical case, right? We don't want to shut down the economy because of the economic costs. The two cases are actually the same case. That the, the more you try to keep the economy open, the, just the more you drag out this crisis and the worse you're going to make the recovery in the long term. And so when politicians are, are stressing this idea of a, an economic case, a need to keep the economy going and an unwillingness to, to alienate uh, voters, it's, it's that last part that they're worried about. And uh, that suggests a certain, um, I don't know, cowardice is a strong word, but uh, a cowardice, uh, but a, a, a willingness to, to prioritize short-term political factors over what is in the long-term best interests of Albertans. And I think we're at a point we can say that that seems to be what this government is doing. They're saying, we don't want to make people mad. 
and we're not going to do the thing that we know evidence of from both the medical field and from the economic field tells us is in the best interest in the long run of, of, of the province. And we're instead going to try to do the least amount possible in order to, to try to uh, weaken the, the, uh, the political fallout. And that is a choice a politician can make. It is appropriate for them to make that choice, even when the stakes are this high in matters of life and death. It is also appropriate to hold them responsible for that choice. And that's where these reports, the, the whistle blowing we've seen, really come to, to matter because they help clarify what is happening in the sense of a government saying that they're trying to do, that they are doing things in the interest of what uh, the medical experts are saying, but, but they're not actually doing so necessarily. And they may be even making the process of giving advice harder. Uh, final question, Stuart, and I think I want, want to talk about the, the source of that political pressure for the government to do less than it, it ought to. And we know from the August, uh, there was a, a, a survey that came out uh, from Angus Reid in August that talked about how 18% of Canadians are cynical spreaders. They don't care about, uh, they won't wear a mask, they don't care about public health uh, policy. They're, you know, they're the conspiracy theorists and the, and the pandemic zealots, those sort of people. Conservatives uh, are four times more likely to be cynical spreaders, according to Angus Reid. So that, if you do the math, that means, you know, quite a, a big proportion of Kenny's conservative voter base is going to fall into the cynical spreader category. You've got to think, and we know from comments that he's made publicly and, and that we've seen on social media for he and ministers, that they are, in fact, getting a lot of pressure from, from that group. And that would seem to me to be, given how fringe that group's uh, ideas are, it would seem to be inappropriate that they would hold an outsized influence on the politicians. Yeah, it's, um, I guess in this sense, uh, you could say the position that, uh, that Jason Kenney faces is a more difficult one than someone like John Horgan, right? Uh, in trying to support the, uh, the advice of the, uh, uh, of Dr. Henry in NBC, uh, John Horgan, his his typical voter is going to say, "Yes, do that. Why aren't you doing more?" And there's a strong support for, say, a mandatory mask policy. I just finished a class. I just did a straw poll with my students. To a student, a unanimous support for a public mask mandate. So this is a very popular position, and most popular among the people most likely to vote for the NDP. For Jason Kenney, it's a it's a more difficult political situation. The people most likely to support the UCP are are less likely to be in support of these robust actions. So he does have to do, in order to deliver the, the policy that is in the best interest of Albertans, he has to turn around and speak to his own supporters to give them uh, a certain amount of unwelcome truth, I guess. And that's not easy to do. But the fact that he is unwilling to do so is, is costing Albertans. It's also ironically costing the UCP because they are losing the ability to appeal to that median voter the one who, I mean, there's still, you do all that math out, calculate it out, there's still uh, a solid majority of Albertans who want to see more robust action taken. And, and by uh, uh, catering to that minority on, on whose vote he, he sees himself depending, and rather than um, giving some unwelcome news to, to that group, he is uh, ironically uh, hurting the, uh, the response in Alberta so that it has the worst outbreak in the, in the country and also hurting the prospects of the UCP to continue to, to win elections. Like we, see, we have seen recent polls where uh, the, the UCP is pulling neck and neck with the NDP just a uh, short while after winning a commanding majority. So they've lost support over this. And uh, in the long run, the price they pay may be political. And in the short run, the, the price may be paid by Albertans. Stuart, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Thank you.